my first fish question is uh, where where were you when this project reached you? You know, I, I know Jeremy, you're a producer on the film as well. Mm -hmm. But where were you in your lives, your careers, or did it arrive just as a script, or did you meet Emma and Chris beforehand, or well, how, did, start, how did it come to you? You met it first. Um, so Emma, Chris, and I, and most of the people uh, that worked on the film, and Lucy as well, um, were all students at University College London and um, at the time there weren't any uh, performance or film courses there, I don't think there are even now, um, but there were very active societies, student yeah. societies uh, as a result of that. Uh, and so there's very active drama societies, very active TV and film society. Uh, and, and I'd done a lot of theatre and I wanted to get into film and I met Chris through a, a mutual friend, um, Ivan, who, um, who, who worked on it as the, as the gaffer. And he said, oh, I've got a short film script. Ivan says, you're a pretty good actor. I want you to, um, to, to have a read of this. I want to make it on, on a weekend on you know 16 mil black and white and see if you know see how it comes out and that was larceny um, and we did exactly that it went to cambridge short film festival was great learned a lot enormous learning curve of of acting on film for the first time acting on film for the first time in the 1990s when there's no playback um and so you don't see what you've done until <laughs> it's <laughs> you get you get the print back from Boots, um, you know, and you've got your thumb over the camera and things like that. Um, so it's we did that, and he said, "I've got this idea for uh, for a feature, and I want to do it in a similar sort of style, really small crew. Will you come on board? I've I've kind of written the main character for you because because you're a bit like him, <laughs> um, but." It would be great if you can find, you know, some of your sort of like theatre pals and, and, and some locations and, and and bring stuff together to, to help me and Emma produce it. And so we're like, yeah, all right, yeah, I'll do that. So um, so that's that's how it came to me and he showed me the script and it was sort of like, don't understand this in the slightest. Because the, the fractured timeline was already there in the script that he presented and, and I had to take it apart and... Um, put it back together in chronological order so that I had any idea of my of my character arc the, the, through the through the um, and the three different timelines that are played out um, and sort of right yeah okay let's do this let's get on with it um, and he, we had a you know a shooting schedule it was quite long um, it was it was only going to be shooting one day a week uh, on a Saturday one roll of black and white film a week which was all Chris could afford in his um, job um, at the time. Uh, and we were working and we came together one day a week, we shot stuff and um, yeah, and that's 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 where I was. Um, so yeah, and Lucy, where were you? Drunk um, in a bar. Drunk in a bar. Uh, <laughs> Yulu, Yulu uh, bar is what I remember. Coming up to you, uh, I'd finished, um, but we knew each other from the Drama Society. I hadn't been involved with Film Sock, um, but uh, came up to you going, oh, what are you doing? And you said, uh, oh, I'm in a film. And I said, can I be in it? <laughs> and you I were a bit like, you can audition. You have to audition. <laughs> <laughs> I probably said something quite rude back. Uh, and then I turned up and I auditioned. And I remember auditioning in the Black Box Theatre, yeah, the, the UCL the studio, Black in the Studio, studio Theatre. Yeah, there's a workshop. Um, and that's where I first met Chris, and uh, I auditioned and got the part. Felt very pleased with myself. Um, and really didn't know what I was getting into, because I'd never done any film. Um, so I didn't know about playback. I mean, I didn't just, just kind of did it for doing it, really. Yeah. and. And because for me at, uh, at UCL, I'd done a language degree and I'd spent, the, the, my most enjoyable time was spelled at, spent at Drama Society, which is clearly where I ended up afterwards. And that was the value of university. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's how, and then I, I got the script and just, I didn't know any better. So I was just like, yeah, okay. Thing is, all the all the rest of us have the context of Chris's entire career. Yeah. To kind of go, oh, I see what that is, but you're you're the first people to see it. You're the first people to kind of see that kind of storytelling. From yeah, you. and yeah. I really remember the first time I saw the film, and it was just like, oh, 
it's actually a film because <laughs> you had no idea. I mean, you'd worked with Chris before, so you yeah. knew about the shorts. I was like, you know, it's just kind of like, let's, let's just, ooh, somebody wants me to be in their film. How marvellous. <laughs> uh, let's go with it. Um, and, and then I was really happily surprised. I, was, I remember kind of going, it's really good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, I don't know if any of you have ever made student films or been in student films, but it's, it's a lottery. You know, some of them are great and some of them are interesting. There's, and sometimes they're both. Uh, there's the haunted nods of people who've definitely. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm yeah. like, I know some yeah. of you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I was going into it. I mean, you, you knew more that you were going into something that was probably going to be quite good because you'd worked with him a couple of times before. And yeah, but, but he, at the time he was the only director that I've worked with. Since then. I've discovered he was quite good. Yes, he was quite good. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fair to say. That he actually yeah. knew what he was doing. But, yeah. that, but that's the thing. In the past 25 years, I've made other films. I've worked with yeah. other directors. You have done a lot more than me. Um, and now it's apparent that he really did know what he was doing. It's, yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, and he just saw the whole film. He has, a, he has the cut film in his head when he makes something. So there are scenes, the, the cafe scene where I first meet Cobb, um, because we were with Emma working behind you, with Emma sitting so behind me. Um, so sweet. And because we were working on 60 mil film, uh, that was the most expensive thing. Getting that processed was the most expensive thing. Um, that was, you know, the vast majority of our budget, apart from some yeah. Primula for cheese sandwiches. <laughs> uh, Literally. And so Chris would, we wouldn't do a typical Hollywood setup of sort of like, here's the wide shot, and then here's the medium shot, and then here's your close up, and here's your close up. It would be, we'll start, with we'll just do down to this line here on the wide, and then we'll both go to close ups, uh, and then we'll do that close up, we'll come back for these two lines on a wide, and we'll just do, we'll run to the end on the close up. Because he already had it edited yeah. in his head, and that he was his to. way of saving money. Yeah, and, and that, and, and us rehearsing. And so, yeah, and, well, we rehearsed a lot yeah, yeah. before. And the, the shooting ratio is something ludicrous, like two and a half to one of... of Which is of, incredibly low. Yeah, in yeah. Cut film to, to finish film. But it is just the fact, it's just having someone who's, who's just kind of gone, okay, money's going to allow me to do this much. So how can I maximise what I'm doing? And, and having the plan to do it, Having having the, the, the plan of this in wonderfully intricate shooting schedule, but but allowed for complete screw ups of continuity that would just go under the radar, mm -hmm. and and that we would buy it as an audience, and then putting the whole thing together. I mean, that's just. And he still uses that technique as well yeah. of not co of not doing coverage because it forces the edit and that means the exec producers can't get in and meddle and yeah. go back and say oh, no you should yeah. do this it means that there just isn't the material to be able to change the the scene yeah well, great it's worked out well for him I think. <laughs> and uh, I mean and how is it for you as actors so you're saying that there was from the get-go there was this plan that you you know you knew what film could be afforded and you knew you'd be filming mm -hmm. one day a week so presumably you knew you were making a commitment of at least weeks probably months to to do this how is that um in terms of like again chris has got the film in his head i'm so familiar calling him chris um, <laughs> but, sure. um but the you know but how is it sort of maintaining a character for you and maybe you know maybe sort of more trivial things like hair continuity and all those things as well but kind of making a film on one day a week for a year or however long it was how is that for you as actors is that a challenge to kind of sort of i didn't know any better it? right um and i'm like oh, yeah, I, did, I don't know if i did, did i get hair and makeup credit on that and a costume <laughs> because we were you know we, we were doing all of that ourselves so it just kind of went mm, just got to keep your hair kind of the same length and um i genuinely just didn't know any better and it was a really fun adventure and it, for me, it was doing more of what I had found that I really loved. And during the, the, the time that we shot this was after I'd finished. And it was kind of during that period that I was going through a, a, a period of, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Am I carrying on with my degree? Or am I going to just go, no, I want to be an actor. So it was 
kind of part of a learning process for me, I think, of, of, of feeding that. And so it was just, yeah, it was just a, a, an adventure for me that eventually led to me <coughs> completely changing what I was doing. So. Yeah. yeah, and it did take over a year um, yeah. to, to shoot in the end. It was something like four months to start with, but then, yeah, it became was apparent. It? Yeah, I've still got the original shooting schedule. <laughs> um, four or five months to start with but yeah it soon became apparent that we were never going to be able to hit that um, because we weren't able to, to get enough done yeah. in, in one day in because we couldn't go to another location um, yeah. or very rarely we did there was a very small crew it was it was Chris on camera um, just about everything is a two shot um, with two actors uh, Ivan on lighting what what little lighting there was other than daylight and Dave um, David Lloyd on sound so you could fit all of us and the kit into a London taxi and, and we, we did we, we did that occasionally yeah. that was um, but that must have been the other big expense not yeah yeah funny. To, I mean, to go seriously, from one location yeah. to another to try and get more done in and all day. the locations were beg borrowed uh, I mean uh, th th so my yeah my character's apartment was literally my apartment yeah. at the time yeah. Um, that makes the scene where it gets I searched especially hard. I was it? like, yeah. oh my god, I'm being in that kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't have any scenes. What were you doing in my kitchen? Because we were hanging out. Oh, I don't right. know. Or maybe um, we, cut your, maybe we um, were rehearsing or your talking. Your apartment or... was Chris's parents' house yeah. in Highgate. Um, yes. The bar was Dick Bradsell's bar, which was yeah. um, he was the, the such the a guy. good location for the yeah. black and white. The doors are amazing. Yeah. So. Mm. They um, look, I mean, that's just, you know, you'd pay God knows how much for it, but it just looks yeah. so great on the black and white. But in terms of, yeah, in terms the of portals. continuity in hair, then obviously there are three timelines. We did all of my stuff with long hair before, then I got my hair cut. Mm. Um, then we could mix and match a bit more. There was, there was a break in filming um, because Alex <laughs> went to the Edinburgh Film Festival with a play and shaved all of his hair off. Um, and so we had to wait a uh, couple of months for his hair to grow back right. before we could shoot mm -hmm. anything with him again. So we decided to make a, <laughs> a short film in between, which we called Doodlebug, um, which some of you may have seen, or is, is, uh, is generally on the internet. Um, so yeah, so it took a long time. Um, in terms of continuity, in terms of acting, yeah, we didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, we literally didn't know any better. But it was getting together with the same group of people so much fun in the same costumes regularly on a Saturday morning and just yeah being, I mean, we being that met. character again and being that person again oh. and and also yeah the, the the casting was close to the people that we are as well so you know Chris wrote the the part of Bill for me Lucy was you know blonde and dangerous so um, uh, that's <laughs> I used to be blonde and dangerous as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's gone now. It's wasn't gone. it fun? <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, and I was going to say, actually, we were talking about how the film is, you know, it's, sort of, it's got this kind of timeless quality and it's, sort of, it's lasted incredibly well. Do you feel like for filmmakers who are going to, I mean, I'm assuming they're all, they get as cast as good as you and they're all as talented as Chris and Emma, but um, do you think the, sort of the lessons of, of, of that shoot would be applicable to, do you think it's a very, you know, people could make things in that style now? Do you think anything would be different? Or do you think it's sort of broadly a transfer? It'd be cheaper. Yeah, I mean, it'd be cheaper because you can shoot it on an iPhone. Yeah, yeah. You can shoot it 4K on an iPhone yeah. um, uh, with roughly about the same amount of lighting, if at all necessary. Yeah. But the the lessons that are important is um, is if you don't if you can only shoot one day a week, then you shoot it in black and white because you're not going to be able to get the the same lighting temperature. Yeah week in week out in in the same locations you've got led lights now so that would be much easier you probably could and then you grade it much easier you we didn't use uh guns we used a hammer because the guns that we could afford will would always look a bit rubbish uh and we made it on you know the mean streets of bloomsbury and it's a london very london yeah. based very thriller based burglar type film you can't make a western on you know in bloomsbury <laughs> square so th so it's it's making it's making films with what you have um which are the i think are the really important lessons that come out of of following yeah 
No, I mean it's it's, it's incredibly well told to it. And I was going to say we, we we you talked to Lucy about like how you felt when you first saw the film. Did you have the same uh, thing, Jeremy, or were you more confident that you it was all going to kind of come together in the end? Or? Um, when did we first see the film? Berkeley, wasn't it? Um, San Francisco Film Festival. No, no, we had cast and crew screening in Mr. Young's, didn't we? And then the world premiere was I at San seem to remember, Yeah, I seem to remember it being somewhere in Soho. Yeah, so we had a cast and crew yeah. screening in Mr. Young's. And I think we did a bit of a recut after that as well, because the original script and the, the, the timeline started cutting much earlier and the feedback from from the screening was that the people actually needed almost the first three or the first 20 minutes to get used to the characters yeah. and to understand who they were before you could start seeing like them in different yeah. states so we actually chris actually recut it with gareth so that the first 20 minutes plays more or less straight introducing bill and cobb um, and then starts cutting the, the, the timeline in between. Mm. Um, so, but uh, yeah, I mean, well, uh, no, I was just I was just being completely vain and going, oh, I should have done that differently. Oh, I look quite good there. Okay, yeah. I'm, now, I'm just gonna say again, <laughs> what I said before we turned the cameras on, is each time I see it now, I'm blown away by how good you were because, no, but seriously, the whole thing hangs around your character. No, no, but if you were shit, it wouldn't work. No. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, given how old we were and the experience we had, I think it's, it, uh, there's just so many little moments that I'm really appreciating. Mm. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so and I, but I do think that's, that, you know. Yeah. You were great too, by the way. <laughs> no, I thought that, that, that well, thank you. But I do think that, you know, if you didn't have a really solid central uh, performance as Bill and definitely it helped that he knew you so so he was writing for you yeah. and he played to he knew what you could do and he so I mean it was a you know it's a sort of symbiotic relationship but I think that's a very much a part of why it works and equally if you are making films on a very small budget your casting is key because you save yourself time money effort and everything if you cast well if you cast badly you are Indeed, let's not even go there one, th one variation of the story I've heard like a lot of uh, actors say in particular is that it's really great when you make a film and you form this kind of community or family or team and you're really tight and then you never see each other again and so it's really nice that you're still here now complimenting each other's performances Thursday and, night yeah. we were all together yeah so but I mean it, like the, whole, the whole lot and does that speak as Ivan, Dave David from the music so yeah and does that speak because you were uh, such an effective team, do you think? Is that always just luck that you all kind of get along? Well, it was a really long time, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I think it was a really amazing and fun experience doing it like that. And, you know, jumping in a taxi, travelling all around London, and then suddenly going, oh, God, we actually made something that's quite good. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah uh, it's... Because we were students or just, just graduates, and we didn't... Um, we didn't have reason for making this other than we wanted to tell a story. You know, we all wanted to, to, to make a film. We weren't being paid for it. Um, we had the energy and the enthusiasm to all get together and, and, and to try and do something. And, and I think in that sense, it's, it's far more rewarding, it's far more real than, than just, you know, sort of like, here's your five weeks, here's your paycheck, and, you know, then you're on to the, the, the next film or something like that. You're less invested in it. And we had no idea what it was going to become or, you know, that Chris might actually become quite successful um, <laughs> as a filmmaker. Um, but it was great to, you know, to, to go on that journey. And Chris and Emma have been um, forever grateful for to us uh, uh, for for that journey that that we went on, the fact that he's recorded something, you know, yeah. for for us today, and since two thousand and five, Batman Begins, that we both had cameos in, he's invited the cast and crew to. Um, uh, so to we see each other at every premiere. Every it's premiere. really nice. It's like yeah. Hi. so every every couple of years we all meet up, yeah. slightly fatter, slightly grayer, um, talk about the kids, uh, and yeah, yeah, Thursday night we were at Oppenheimer, so. Um, 
It's amazing. Yeah, it's really cool. And how has it felt for you? I mean, obviously, uh, the film is very well reviewed and, and, and well attended. But how has it felt for you in terms of the way the film has been perceived over time? Did it feel did it feel to you like audiences and critics were getting it from minute one, or has that kind of shifted in the way people respond to it? Uh, I I mean I just remember because for me it was the timing was quite. Was, was great. Uh, I went to drama school and literally when I came out of drama school was when the film came out. And so I just thought, oh, that's it. <laughs> you know, it's gonna be, like, it doesn't always work that way. However, you know, it was, it was amazing because it, you know, just started going to film festivals and, and, and again, going into something with zero expectation. So the fact that it went to one film festival, we were like, oh my God. And then it won a prize, and then it went to another film festival, and you're just kind of going, wow. Um, and it became this really, really cool sort of journey of, and, and, and obviously it was brilliant for him because it was just this incredible calling card, but I mean, my experience of it was, um, was it? That was one of the screenings we went to, and there was a guy who was, I think he might have been an agent or something, and coming into the cinema and I'm just kind of going, oh, hi, where do we go? And this guy goes, just get, this is the star of the movie. And I'm just like going, oh my God. <laughs> and, and this was sort of this, uh, yeah, I mean, it was just sort of wonderful, weird and strange. Uh, so it was just a really cool kind of period and journey. And I think that there was an ele element of, of luck in it. Um, of the time that we made it, it was the time of of guerrilla filmmaking. So it was yeah. the time of Rodriguez El Mariachi, of of Black uh, Blair Witch Project, of um, Kevin Smith's Clerks, and of mm. and of yeah, of zero budget films being able to go to festivals and being bought, being taken seriously, being taken seriously, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and being bought and then being distributed, you know, getting theatrical distribution. So we were very lucky. Um, you know, we sent, Chris sent it off in, in VHS tapes to, to a bunch of festivals, including Slam Dance, and um, it was rejected from there and they suggested San Francisco and that's where we got in and that was 1998 mm. and that was the world premiere. And that's where we met Peter Broderick, who right. from Next Wave Film, who said, "You know, this is fantastic. Um, I want to, I want to take this. I want to blow it up to thirty-five mil. I want to do a new sound um, mix on it, and I want to take it to Toronto because I think that we can sell it." Um, and that's exactly what he did. And that's where we got distribution in the U.S., in mm. France, uh, in the U.K., which was appalling. Yeah. Which I'll never yeah, yeah, but we got distribution. For. I mean, that was amazing. It um, <laughs> was like, <laughs> and yeah, and the reviews were coming out, and as, yeah. and, uh, and it was fantastic. Um, we we had a bit of a problem with San Francisco, which was once that we got accepted, um, they wanted a print, and um, yes. we didn't have one. So, yeah. in those days, you didn't, you know, upload your stuff to Film Freeway. You literally mm -hmm. sent out VHS tapes. Um, and then they said, well, this is a proper film festival and we need a 16 mil print. And it's sort of like, oh, okay. Um, and so we had to go back and we hadn't done the neck cut at that point. We had to go back and cut the neck and print it, um, which cost another 4,000 mm. pounds or something like that mm. at the time. And I took both prints in my hand luggage on, on my Virgin Atlantic flight to San Francisco because Chris and Emma had already moved to the US by then. Again, so. that's where the shorter running time comes in handy. Yeah, you're, absolutely. Your baggy, yeah. Uh, yeah. baggage allowance would have been a great Oppenheimer, moment. 11 yeah. miles long, <laughs> yeah. 600 pounds. Yeah, that would have been, yeah, that would have been too much. Yeah. And it must be it must be quite gratifying. I'm, I'm sure. I'm hoping that you've heard from young filmmakers who've been inspired by the film as well, and, and sort of it's inspired them to make their own mm. movies too. Yeah, and it's uh, yeah, it, it is always gratifying, and it, it's always really touching that that people are still discovering it today and, and finding you know Chris's early work. Every every film that he makes, every couple of years, he brings out a film, and and following gets revisited, which is which is wonderful, and people pick it up. And they see it for the first time, which is fantastic. Um, and it's it stands up. It stands up probably better than some of the guerrilla filmmaking, some of the guerrilla films from that time as well. But also, I mean, hopefully, also it's it's inspiring because you know you can make something with 
you know, with, with goodwill and, and people who are invested. And, but you don't need financial investment. You need some, but you know, it doesn't need big bucks to, to make something that holds together that can then take you to a next level of storytelling. And, and, I, and I, that's what I just hope people are still finding in, inspiring. I mean, that's kind of what I pull out of it when people ask me about it, is just anyone, well, not anyone, you, ha you need the script. You need the script. I mean, his script is very clever. But, you know, if you've got, the, if you've got a good idea, you just can't make it. And especially now with, you know, with, with the, the, the facility, with, with the iPhone, I mean... On that inspiring note, I'm going to hand over to the haunted eyes of the filmmakers. <laughs> so, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. We yes. I was wondering about the the Batman logo on the door. Um, who's yeah. the kid? I saw if it was already present because it's quite a nice coincidence. It is quite a nice coincidence, and it is entirely a coincidence. So, <laughs> no, yeah, uh, of course. Uh, a lot. No, your, your flat inspired Chris to decide <laughs> that he wanted to, um, you know. <coughs> Look at the it, it has been written about, uh, and there, is, there are a couple of academic texts that r write about the set design uh, <laughs> and the production, <laughs> production design of following, um, with reference to, to three things, the Batman logo, um, the picture of, of Jack Nicholson mm -hmm. um, from The Shining, because um, Chris was a big Kubrick fan, and the use of the name um, Danny Lloyd as well, mm -hmm. um, which is the name of the of the young child in The Shining, um, and it's all completely coincidental. Yeah. So, as I said earlier, my my apartment was my apartment, um, and Chris was. We were discussing locations. And I said, "Well, look, you can use my apartment. That will be easier, cheaper, quicker than than doing anything else." Uh, and he came round for the for sort of the first time, and I said, "Look, you know, there's there's a Batman thing on on the door that's like from the Keaton Batman from Total Film. It was a sticker. And we had a black door. It kind of looked cool. Um, and I've got all these sort of like postcards of films and stuff. Do you want me to take those down? Should we? He said, no, it looks kind of scuzzy. You know, <laughs> well, we'll just use it as it is. <coughs> Um, and the credit card story was that, that all of our credit cards had our full names on them and it was only David Lloyd's that had D. Lloyd. Mm. Um, and so we couldn't, because we were doing pickups on, on, you know, on the credit cards, which I don't think it's even, you can even really see, but you, know, you might be able to at one point or if you freeze frame it. Um, we didn't want to use our own names because we, you know, we're supposed to be the characters. So we used David Lloyd, who was a sound guy, because it just said D. Lloyd. But we couldn't use David Lloyd because it was his name. My best friend was Danny, so we went with Danny Lloyd. And I had absolutely no idea that it was a complete coincidence uh, that that the kid in in Shining is um, is is that's the the same name. So all of these things are, um, yeah, pure coincidence. So conspiracy theory killed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yep. Hello. Um, thank you both for coming down tonight. Um, and I just wanted to ask uh, whether you were talking about the rehearsal process. Um, I just wonder, because you were also saying about the precision with which um, Chris was shooting, what was the focus of rehearsals and sort of how did that work? That's a good question. We haven't really um, talked about that. It's so we didn't waste time. So the actors knew what they were doing, so that, uh, you know, we had one day a week to shoot. Mm. So we needed to get as much done as possible. So we would rehearse in film stock, mostly, wasn't it? Yeah, we rehearsed for about a month, yeah. weekends and evenings. And, and we knew, you know, knew where we were shooting, so you'd have the sort of the layout of the, the but, but that way, you know, you, there was no time wasted when we got in location for us to, as actors to kind of work out going, oh, well, maybe if I went here or how about, you know, all that time that, that, that is now taken up on a set where, you know, you've got the sort of the rehearsal you've and then you've got the crew run through and the blocking yeah. and this and that, that all gets condensed. Mm -hmm. That's done elsewhere. So you get there and you, you hit the ground running and we're all like, yep, we know what we're doing. And so that we could develop characters so that Chris, because it was his first feature he could see that character development and we could talk about that as well 
and so that he knew that we were you know that we were off book as it as it were uh, and that we could carry on and that we could ad lib to a certain extent in character if we needed to uh, and um, or if you know a light fell over or something like that that we could keep running he still might be able to use some of it um, the scene in the cafe cartouche where you tell the story of um, the accountant getting mm. his um, uh, his hand broken that's mm. I'm told by Kevin McCarthy the um, not the US senator but the US <laughs> uh, film reviewer that's one of the only scenes that Chris has ever let people ad lib in all of his films <laughs> aren't we lucky <laughs> wow. good question Mm. Uh, good answer too. Um, yeah, and he continued. Sorry, he continues yeah. to try and use rehearsal as well. He loves rehearsing and and doing all, a lot of that stuff beforehand. And rehearsed loads with Guy Pearce and Carrie Ann Moss and Memento as well. Also with Heath Ledger. Heath Ledger spent six months mm. putting um, the Joker characters together and keep on going back to Chris with physical movement and voice and designs. Um, uh, for the um, with uh, with costume designer of how he wanted it to look and the makeup design so it looked like he he had applied it himself and stuff so mm -hmm. it's a, it's a very big part of his storytelling of of, of making uh, you know that world um, with with Nathan Crowley as well on production design. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for coming down, Echo. Um, going for it. Um, for the scene where you cut your hair and shave. Mm. Why is it in a kitchen and not in a bathroom? Um, because right. my bathroom, um, yeah, literally my bathroom in that in that apartment was behind the kitchen and there was no available mm. light to it. So the only available light was through the kitchen yeah. windows. Um, we didn't have enough lights to be able to light it effectively. Uh, and it was really small and mm. we probably couldn't have got us all in there. I think that's one of the 20 year questions you've been waiting for. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it was really fun because I was actually watching that scene going, oh, the lighting's great in there. Yeah, <laughs> huge amounts of daylight yeah. pouring in through the yeah, windows. Yeah, yeah. I think there was a question a couple of rows back, maybe, or, yeah? Um, a lot of the moments within the film seemed quite um, reminiscent of classic cinema to me. So the, the face slapping and um, the, the way that you see the reaction to the violence, not the violence, which obviously must have had practical elements to, to consider. Yep. Did you have um, a sense of homage to anybody at the time or did you discuss favourite filmmakers and favourite directors at the time amongst yourselves? Um, I don't think in relation to this film particularly. It has very obviously a film noir look and feel to it, um, literally because we only had a couple of redheads to be able to light it with or with daylight. Um, and, and so that that automatically lends itself to that and the storyline uh, the story lends itself to that as a as a you know as a thriller as well um yeah th i mean there are elements of 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 hitchcock in it probably that you could you could take f um from it um but i don't think i mean we we used to go out and for, for dinner a lot to it's Pizza Pasta, I think, on Top of Court Road, and and talk about if films. That's a lot, where there's of thanks to Pizza Pasta. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's none of the um, none of the films that we were seeing at the time, or that we were particularly talking about. Um, I think are are, are, are referenced um, very clearly in in following. I think it feels like that because it's black and white. I mean, I think that just sort of suddenly you you, you get lots of sort of you know, in the back of your head, this sort of it, it evokes things we've seen in the past, but I'm not sure. I mean, I certainly didn't. I wish I could say I had all that in my head, but for me, it was just, oh, here we are, off we go. Um, but I think it's it, it, that that kind of put, we kind of pulls it out of us because I find myself watching it going, oh, is that from? Oh, is that from? And and I think it is to do with 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 the lighting and the and the, the black and white. But now it's part of the noir pantheon, isn't it? It's, it's <laughs> become one of those films. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Claire. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's a question for Lucy actually, because it's really interesting to hear about you know you did your own makeup and your costume because actually it was so perfect. It was such a perfect kind of like noir <laughs> femme fatale. But now like all the way through Nolan's work, yeah, like that's kind of the 
like the ear techs that are actually the ear female and in, in, in Logan spends a lot of them sort of Carrie Moss and Cotillard and you know they all seem kind of like you you were the original sort of blueprint of all that so so how do you <laughs> <laughs> so how can you talk please a keep about talking yes <laughs> <laughs> can you talk a little bit about that process about um, making the character because obviously that's it just seems that you've seen that character all the way through and and how it is seeing kind of other versions of it in, in future films and things oh my god I'm practically melting on my seat thinking that Marion Cotillard is is any kind of version of me <laughs> just give me a second <laughs> wow oh, I love her so much um, I think that's a really lovely question uh, uh, and uh, I don't know how how true that is I mean I interestingly I see I see Chris as quite a if you like a masculine director, I think his stories very much lean towards the sort of the masculine in life. I think he has and continues to have extraordinary women, but they, you know, the main thrust of most of his stories are, are male stories. And whether that then means because you see less of the women that they are more mysterious or they are more opaque, um, you know, I know it was chicken and egg. Um, I will, I mean, I will say that, you know, in his later films, I find myself looking at the women just going, I just want to know more about them. Yeah. I want to see more. Uh, but that's partly, you know, my taste in stories and, and, um, and, and it's n not necessarily, I want to see more at the expense of any of the other. I just, you know, that, that he has some really intriguing and mm -hmm. interesting female characters but they do tend to be that you know they're not front and center, um, because that that's not his storytelling mm. um, so far. Mm. Um, I don't know if that is any kind of answer. Yeah, I just felt that the, the, your character is so well. Obviously, it's quite a difficult world to play because you're playing this kind of like you know there's all the, the mystery within that. And um, but it could have been you know Grace Kelly. It, it kind of feels like a you know, a character from Yeah, there's a very and classic and kind of, mm. yes, the sort of the, the, the femme fatale. I mean, you know, she is very opaque. You don't know what's going on with her. Um, I think, uh, I don't know how to say this elegantly without landing myself in it, but I think I, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing <laughs> and I think I got away with it. Uh, I think the fact that she is so opaque for me as an actor helped me mm. um, so it was again I mean you could say it was good casting mm. that mm. He, he he allowed it to play to whatever strengths I had as an actor at the time <coughs> you know I was a fledgling I was you know a real baby actor I didn't know what I was doing uh, I'd done theatre you know Jerry had a lot relatively a lot more experience than I had on film so um you know, I, I, I love watching it, but, uh, you know, I sort of, I see a baby actor when I look at myself when I'm doing it. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that's sort of a helpful answer. But yeah, it's just, just lovely, beautifully done, beautifully yeah. done. It's always like, it's, it always feels better when you're looking back on a film with, you know, even the uncertainty you felt, we're all looking back in the context of it all working out great. So, yeah, I know, <laughs> so, I know, right? So it was fine. I know, <laughs> fine. I know. Um, so uh, if you, anyone has any last questions, it can, yes, you're, you're going to round off the evening, no pressure. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, he was um, he was a key grip. Yes. Um, so there's only one shot that is on sticks or on a do um, on a dolly, which is um, there's a tracking shot in the um, uh, in the interrogation scene. Everything else is handheld, um, and um, yeah, Jonah was the um, was the was the grip on that. So he was he was moving the dolly moving the camera on the dolly along. Um, but he was only just out of school, out of college or something like that. He then. was a baby so, as well. Um, so yeah, he was, he was in his early 20s mm. uh, at that time. Um, but it was it was shortly afterwards, well, shortly after we finished when Chris and Emma moved to the US and they drove from Chicago where part of a sort of family home was to 
to LA that that Jonah related the story of, of Memento uh, and they talked about that um, and they talked about how they were going to make that. Yeah, yeah, you've ended it well. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry we're out of time because obviously we could talk for ages. Uh, you've been excellent guests. You've been closing cold cases left, right and centre, <laughs> solving <laughs> mysteries, and you've been very inspiring to all of us. So uh, let's all give you a round of applause. Thank you very much.